with the topic on compassionate leadership. Let me give a short introduction of Professor Alvin before we continue. Alvin Ng has the title Mental Wellbeing at Work, The Need for Compassionate Leadership this morning. Dr. Alvin Ng Lai On is currently a professor and head of department at, of psychology at Sunway University, Malaysia. He is a clinical psychologist by training. His areas of research includes mental health literacy, positive psychology, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and cross-cultural factors in psychotherapy. Dr. Alvin is also a adjunct senior lecturer at the Jeffrey Chia School of Medicine and Health Sciences at Monash University, Malaysia, as well as an honorary senior lecturer at the Norwich Medical School, University of East Anglia, UK. Alvin has given numerous talks on mental health topics to the public and organizations. He is very passionate about empowering the community to initiate conversations on mental health, to seek help and to stop the stigma, stigma surrounding mental illness. Alvin's, uh, you always find Alvin's talks very enjoyable with his uh, splinter with lots of jokes and uh, practical examples. So with this, I'd like to pass the floor over to Alvin. Hello, good morning. Brother Bobby, thank you very much for that very nice introduction you just give me a lot of pressure to be funny it's not easy to be funny especially when you watch all those stand-up comedians perform uh, they do a lot of practice and uh, with me here this morning there's no practice at all so <gasps> pressure all right um good morning everyone and uh, thank you for being here today it is one of those very weird uh, talks to give especially because it's online I don't get to see any of you. I'm just talking to the screen and the camera. So if you find me a bit slow, that's because I'm also trying to cope with how to talk to a screen without getting any kind of feedback. I don't see people nodding, shaking their heads, looking confused, smiling. So these kinds of stuff are very much needed when you want to converse with people. And so talking to a screen is quite unusual. Although I'm supposed to have already been um, used to it, after a full semester of online teaching at Sunway University, but still, you know, if the human contact is missing, uh, it's kind of weird. So there you go. Uh, right. So how's everyone's mental health today? Are you okay? I'm okay because it's the weekend, yay. And uh, once I start working tomorrow, I'm probably gonna get really stressed up, uh, maybe starting even tonight. <laughs> but that's how it is, isn't it? Every now and then, when demands are high, we get stressed up. And this is why when I was asked to give a talk to all of you, I decided, you know, I think it's very important to talk about mental health at the workplace um, and the need for compassionate leadership. Because unless you are a compassionate leader, the people under you may not be given much help because you don't even know that uh, your downlines have difficulties managing. And you won't really know unless they tell you uh, but that's a difficult thing or tricky thing because most people who have any emotional issues tend to not want to talk about it to their bosses. So you need to take the initiative to communicate to your employees, that is if you are uh, an employer or a manager, uh, and employees need to also know how to be empowered enough to communicate to their bosses, their management about the help that is needed, especially when you're going through a difficult patch. And now we are under a global pandemic. Everyone is struggling. Even before this pandemic, there have been a lot of people um, having and facing mental health issues. So today's talk is where I would like to touch on how we can have more conversations about mental health 
it is a very important thing. Just like how when I asked you earlier, how's your mental health today? Perhaps that is something that can open up conversations rather than just how are you today, which, you know, the standard answer is I'm fine, thank you, because that's what we've been taught since we were kids. Um, but I would like to go a step further by actually asking, how's your mental health today? And to a lot of people, mental health is, a, is such a huge stigma that they go, whoa, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, really, really, I'm okay. Um, because there is so much fear about even touching the issue of mental health. We're not even talking about mental illness, We're talking about health, just like physical health. Uh, asking how you are today usually is about physical health and yeah, maybe social health, right? So uh, I hope that by the end of this talk, we can have more conversations about mental health in general and specifically for today's topic is mental health at work. Because back to the pandemic, a lot of people are losing jobs. A lot of people are afraid of losing jobs because, you know, if we go into another MCO, it's going to be a huge disaster for a lot of people. Even right now, um, you probably would have heard that Sunway Pyramid had one case of COVID. And a lot of people are now avoiding Sunway Pyramid. But I can let you know, it's one of the best places to come to at the moment because there's hardly anyone around. Uh, it's pretty empty. Empty means safe. You're safe from people. And you know, there's definitely lots of social distancing. Yes, so there's a bit of plug for Sunway <laughs> Pyramid. Come over, it's nice. I live just next door, so I feel very safe. Best people. Okay, so um, going, coming back to the fear of, of losing jobs, you know, that is in itself a huge stress already. And you know, for some places that have downsized, you now have got even more work to do. Just like myself. I'm a head of department and I'm told that there won't be any new headcount, although we need the extra people. We are currently understaffed. But it's how it is everywhere. Uh, hospitals, um, big organizations, some people are getting laid off and a lot of people are afraid of losing jobs. So that fear in itself is already enough to really stress you out. And we know that prolonged stress can lead to mental health issues. All right. So that's what we'll be talking about today. And um, those on Facebook, feel free to type in your questions or any comments. Um, our organizers here would capture them and we'll uh, bring them up at the end of the talk. Or if you are on Zoom, feel free to type your questions in chat. Um, once, you know, I'm a bit more free, I suppose, when I'm not talking too much, I'll probably have a look at what's in chat and I can address your questions or comments uh, as quickly as I can. All right, now, what do we have? The next slide. World Mental Health Day, 10th October, coming very soon. Today is 4th October. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm normally not really aware of what date it is on a weekend because I'm trying to have a complete weekend. Uh, except uh, this morning where I'm giving talks. <laughs> it's okay, um, not, not complaining. But anyway, back to Mental Health Day, October 10th. Um, every year we have Mental Health and Awareness Day to talk more about mental health. And I'm glad that BGF asked me to give a talk this month so that I can promote World Mental Health Day. So if you look at World Mental Health Day 2017, the theme of that year was mental health in the workplace. And I was very happy at the time to hear the theme focusing on the workplace. Because workplace is a very, very important place to focus on mental health management. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of problems with productivity and of course, employee discipline. We, we, like I said, you know, there are lots of demands on employees and the demands are even more, even before COVID, like I was saying, it's already very stressful because we have got globalization happening very, very quickly. I mean, the world is very small these days, especially with emails, you know, live chats. You basically have 24 seven work, work, work. You know? so a lot of people is like that. Even myself as an academic, we don't stop working actually. On, on the weekends, we focus on writing up our research, 
sometimes we won't have meetings in the weekends because on a weekday we don't have time for it. There is um, industrialization everywhere. Even places without industry are now starting to be even more industrialized. Those of you who are in Klang Valley, you know that Klang Valley, KL is expanding very quickly, going south, going north, um, and more and more industries are also in Klang Valley and where you have people living or where you have industry, you have more and more housing estates. So given this industrialization, more and more people are getting very busy. There are all kinds of high tech, you know, online technology to the point that uh, people are also being redundant. You know, we are losing a lot of jobs to artificial intelligence. So who wouldn't be stressed up if you are used to working in traditional jobs that are now run by computers, right? And uh, the World Mental Health Day at the time recognizes this. And just because it's only in 2017 doesn't mean we don't talk about it anymore. I am still talking a lot about mental health at work because it means a lot to me. I'm at work and I'm also very, very uh, under pressure. To, to perform and the performance KPI every year just increased tremendously. We look at how the world grows every year. It's usually about you know five to six percent. We can use inflation as a, as a way of, of counting, but if we look at our goals, our KPI every year, it seems to grow about 20%. And that's crazy, you know, it's humanly impossible. But a lot of bosses tend to focus on that because they don't want to have any kind of ceiling over anyone because who knows if you can make that 20%. But one thing that we tend to forget is, is that 20% um, sustainable? Sustainability is always an issue. For us to keep on working under very high demand uh, conditions, it takes a toll on not just our physical health, but also on our mental health. Eventually, we can break down. So after this, I'll be talking about burnout. Because burnout is a real thing, I'll explain to you later. And um, before we go into that, I want to talk about this year's um, World Mental Health Day team. It is mental health for all. Greater investment, greater access, everyone, everywhere, which I think is wonderful. It is so good because it then opens up the need to, for everyone to talk about mental health. Mental health for all. Greater investment means we need to put in not just money, we need to put in the time, the effort to keep on talking more about mental health. We need to talk about mental health in a way that helps us understand how to access mental health help. All right? And this is for everyone and everywhere. If you look at mental health professionals such as myself, although I'm no longer practicing, the only practice I do is like, like this, now I'm giving talks, but I don't have a clinic. All right, so although you know who I am now, please don't call me up and ask to see me because uh, I, I can't see you professionally as a clinician. But what I can do is I can always refer you. So I'm kind of like a call center. Anyway, back to this team. Everyone everywhere means everyone would need to play a role in providing some kind of mental health help. Or in psychology, we like to use psychosocial support. All right. And the reason why uh, this team is called Everyone Everywhere is because we recognize that in every country, we don't have enough mental health professionals. So only a certain number of people are able to access mental health services. What about the rest? Who can help the rest? Especially if we think about B40 community, right? Someone like me, if I were to work in private, I provide uh, I have a private clinic, I'll be super expensive. The charges for private psychologists, private psychiatrists, even more expensive counselors, range from about 100 an hour, that's considered cheap already, to about three, 400 an hour. And you don't just see the mental health professional once. You know, we are not magicians where you see us once and then poof, you'll be okay straight away. It doesn't work that way. Because you would have taken a long time to develop your problem. It's not gonna go and disappear in one day. So we cost a lot of money because we spend a lot of time on you. And how many people can afford that? Not many at all. Even within the T20, uh, a lot wouldn't be able to, to you know, uh, afford the cost. Because that's, some, uh, that's only um, consultation. What about medication? 
if you need medication, it's also very expensive. It can range from about 500 to more than 1,000 a month. All right, so you don't want to get there uh, if you can, because otherwise the cost is tremendous. Right, so what do we do about it if we want to increase access to psychological help? It means all of us need to learn some kind of skills to provide help for each other. This is something I'll get into a bit later. All right, but basically what I want to encourage everyone here listening is to get some knowledge about how we can help in terms of providing any kind of psychological support to our families, to our friends, to our co-workers, even to our bosses, because they are probably the most stressed up. They have to manage you, they have to manage their bosses. For example, like me, I'm in middle management. I'm a head of department. Yes, I'm boss to my staff, but uh, I also report to uh, upper management. So I'm sandwiched in between. Not a very nice place to be. But we can all do our parts to help others. And this is where I, I use a term here, if you look at my third point, community empowerment. A lot of people feel that they are helpless in helping others because they don't know what to do. Because people don't talk about mental health enough for you to know what to do. You know what to do when somebody has got sore throat, you give all your grandmother, grandfather treatments, right? Um, you know, when someone is sick, you say, drink lots of water, get enough rest, you know, stay home, don't go to work. And in this day and age of COVID, even more, you know, you're going to stay home, don't go, any, go, go anywhere, quarantine yourself for at least 14 days. You know what to tell people. But when it comes to, for example, people with depression, people with high anxiety, um, people with um, addictions, do we know what to do? No. We, we just like, oh, oh, that's serious. I don't know what to do. We should go and see a professional. That's about all we can say sometimes. All we can say, ah, don't worry about it. Lah. You know, you're okay. Come on, you know, get over it. It just shows disempowerment or helplessness. And we cannot afford to be helpless and disempowered anymore. We cannot just simply depend on mental health professionals like me because there's not enough of us. Plus, if they are any, we are, rather, uh, we are going to be very expensive. And if you want to go for the public health service, you're going to have to wait forever because the queue is super long. So I hope you get my, my points. Um, and to be less disempowered, to be more empowered about mental health, we need to have this thing that's called better mental health literacy. Literacy means you're able to read. Health literacy means you know about what to do when there's illness, what to do to improve your health. You know about sleep, exercise, you know, balanced diet, you know all those things, right? And you know if you get sick, you know what to do, you know who to see, um, what you can talk about in terms of helping each other with, with health. You know someone who's sick, you go visit them, you bring food to them, you know what to do. That's health literacy. But you just put the word mental in front there, boom, suddenly we, we just don't know what to do, we don't want to do anything to do with it because the stigma is there, all right? So, we need better mental health literacy. I'll go through with you what it is. And um, we need to understand that our technology for treatment to treat people with mental health problems have tremendously improved. I know because I'm, I have access to global research on it. I've been going for conferences on therapies and we know worldwide all these therapies are being researched and they've been found to work very well. Not 100%, but well enough. There's 60-70% recovery rate and that's really good already. We've got more and more new methods, uh, new medications, new kinds of psychotherapy and all of these have been studied very um, deeply. We know that we have got a lot of very good methods now, but we can't explain why is it that there's an increase on mental health problems worldwide also. You know, if our technology has improved by right, we should have a decrease in mental health problems. But no, we have a huge increase. And now with the COVID, even more. All right. And because of that, because again, we may have good methods, but we don't have enough people who know about these good methods. We don't have enough access to mental health help. All right. So that's the situation at the moment. And I would like to focus on the workplace. 
So a healthy workplace would be, you know, would combine both physical and mental health. Right? But what is it? What is a healthy workplace? Uh, in, in simplistic terms, it is basically a, a work environment that provides you know, a much bigger return of investment, meaning whatever work that you do should be uh, productive in a way that brings in more uh, revenue or income to your company. All right? And in order for you to be productive, you, not, you, you don't just have to be physically healthy. You also need to be mentally healthy, all right? And mental health, and this is where I start giving you better mental health literacy. Mental health is not just about having positive emotions. In fact, you don't have to have positive emotions for you to function mentally well. You only need to basically have um, ability to receive information, process information, and to use the information for problem solving, decision making, that is good to bring in uh, improved productivity, okay? You don't have to be happy. Of course, being happy will be a huge bonus because you then enjoy what you're doing. You are, you are likely to be more motivated to do what you do. But mental health is beyond just emotions. It is also about your cognitive health, how you're able to focus, concentrate, know what you're doing, solve problems without getting too upset. Even if you get upset, you know why you're upset and you can manage your being upset. So um, in simple terms, healthy mind is the ability to function mentally. That's it, all right? But you may or may not be happy, that's fine. But because you're mentally functioning, you're better able to do your work. As simple as that, isn't it? Ta -da! But if you're mentally unhealthy, meaning you have difficulties concentrating, you are grumpy, um, you know, because you have difficulties concentrating, it's difficult for you to then solve problems, make decisions, your productivity will suffer. All right? When your, productiv your productivity suffer, um, people can notice. Either you quit because you can't stand it anymore or you get sacked. So you got high turnover rates either way. And we know from different kinds of industries that, um, you know, some industries just have high turnover rates because it's high stress. For example, in um, corporate com, corporate communications, no, normally the stress is very high. These days, even higher because um, before the internet, um, corporate communication is pretty easy. It's quite quite direct. Now you see something wrong that said somebody goes to Facebook or other social media and complain about you and you need to manage that very, very quickly. You cannot wait anymore. Even if you have gone home, something happens, you've got to go back to work, you've got to address the issue straight away. So obviously you won't have enough rest, you get tired, you get burned out very quickly, you probably want to quit your job. Quit job means, you know, turnover rate. And some people will just not go to work, there's absenteeism. They don't feel like going to work. And now even easier to be absent because if you're working from home, you just have to shut your computer. That's it, you're not working anymore, you're absent. And absenteeism is part of behavioral problems. You either go, don't go to work or you don't do anything at work. Um, or your behavior by being grumpy and scolding people, shouting at people is also a behavior problem. Uh, and because of that, you probably would face very high legal costs because you know if anyone is uh, suing you or you're suing them, not cheap at all. And either way, all of this will contribute to low productivity. So that's pretty unhealthy, isn't it? Especially if you are the boss, the CEO, you want to be your workers, your staff, employees to be as healthy as possible physically and mentally. Otherwise, it's gonna be a huge headache. And this is why it's very important to um, take care of your mental health at work. On, on, uh, on that note also, it's not just about providing a good um, safe, secure, and conducive workplace it is also about recognizing that some of your employees would have existing psychological problems. The World Health Organization says that one in five people at any one time, all right, I better not cover the Buddha here, one in five people at any one time has, oh, my small, okay, there you are, 
my finger was missing just now. One in five people at any one time has a mental disorder. At any one time, yeah? It may be it today, but tomorrow somebody else. And can you imagine if there are 100 people today here, how many of you would probably be living with a mental disorder or mental health issue at least? 20 of you. And that's a lot. All right? So, you know, in a company that is big, you're likely to have a few who are already living and struggling with a mental health issue. But the problem is we tend to only focus about focus on this person. We forget that this one person is living with this second one, living with this two in five, working with this three in five, and neighbors with this four in five. What do these three do? They also have problems. They need to get help to help this person here. Where do they go? Probably this uh, psychologist, counselor, psychiatrist over here. So what this basically shows you is that we are all connected, whether we like it or not. And um, see, I forget my point now. <laughs> uh, if you want to help this person, basically the whole society needs to know what to do. And for us to provide a healthy work environment, can you imagine if everybody, let's say this is not society anymore, this is within a workplace, other people here can provide the help. And if you've got one person here who have the difficulties, the rest need to know how to help this person. You may say, oh, that's unfair, they shouldn't be working. Hey, you know what, the thing is, just because someone has got a psychiatric diagnosis doesn't mean they are useless here. Yeah? A lot of them, you don't even know they have got a psychological diagnosis and they are in your workplace and they're working very, very well. Just that you don't see their struggles. And that's where every organization, if you ask me, should provide some kind of platform for anyone with a mental health condition to access, to help them maintain their wellness as long as possible. So it's not about treating their disorder. It's more about maintaining their order. And this is something that a lot of people don't know about mental disorders. If you have a diagnosis, you don't always show your symptoms. Your symptoms only come out every now and then. But the reason why they are diagnosed is because their symptoms can be quite severe to the point that they're not, they're not able to function. But with um, treatment, sometimes it's medication, sometimes it's medication and therapy because uh, most of the time it's easier to just take medication. Sometimes there's no medication, but they're going through therapy. You won't know but they, they are functioning. So because you don't know, it's always good to provide some kind of safe, secure environment at a workplace that anyone with a mental health condition who are diagnosed would feel secure and they know that they can access this help. I'll be talking more about this later. All right. And the main thing, just look at the, the last point is to empower your talent so that you don't lose them. A lot of people who are talented tend to be given even more work. I'm told that I'm talented at work. I do my work well, well, well enough anyway. I, I, I don't believe so though, I'm still struggling, but a lot of people say that I do well, and somehow I just get even more work. We tend to load the ones who are good with more work without necessarily recognizing that they could already be struggling in the first place. So it happened them. They have talent, they're able to get things done well, but the more you load them, you know, it, is, it can be like a last straw on a camel's back. Yeah, a camel is strong and carry a lot of things, but you take that camel for granted, that camel is probably gonna stop working and either die or go somewhere else. I don't like you anymore. So think about that. All right, and so why today's topic? I've basically given you the reason already. Um, I went ahead of myself. I guess we can save time that way, but Basically, there's lots of change going on. And we know from, from research that whenever there's any change, actually, we don't even have to research. <laughs> we know it ourselves. Whenever there's a big change, right? although it's, it's meant to be a happy change, like, for example, getting married, <laughs> it's very stressful. Right? You've got to prepare a wedding, everything, and those of you who have done that before, you've got the married, you know how stressful it is. Even after the wedding, also, it's still stressful because it's big change. And now we are undergoing huge change all around the world very stressful, it's difficult to maintain productivity. Yeah. Go back to uh, malls that have uh, an 
COVID case, suddenly now you don't have any customers. Productivity automatically goes down, even if you work hard. A lot of people now are pushed to go get customers. Um, those of you who know Hai Ti Lao, there's this hot pot restaurant that is in Sunway. Normally you get very long queues to go in. I never bothered to queue up because to me, I don't like queuing. I mean, if I can go eat somewhere else, I'll eat somewhere else. But this place is so popular, it's got long, very long queues. And since the COVID case last week, <laughs> there were not, no one eating there. And you had their waiters, waitresses standing outside the restaurant trying to pull people in. <laughs> so it's like a huge contrast. So you can imagine the stress of the owners. All right. And you know, stress will definitely affect your emotions. If you're mindful of it, you know. All right. And your stress would affect the people around you too, whether you like it or not. People are affected by your stress. So whatever problems you have is also their problem. And any kind of, of significant change in your workplace would trigger off stress. You know, um, management change. Ooh, people at the bottom go, oh, wow, what's going on? Just like our politics. Suddenly our government change and people are watching, ooh, you know, drama. And then now government wants to change again. Ooh, drama again. Yeah. And we may feel stressed out because those of us who may be a government link will now go, oh, no, what's going to happen to me now? Um, and so many other examples, I won't go through them here. Yeah. But I've spoken earlier about giving, you know, providing a safe, conducive, secure, positive work environment, because by doing so, you would improve productivity because people are more motivated, they're generally happier. And we know that an anxious person is not a learning person. An anxious person is also not a very productive person. So if you can reduce anxiety by providing better, you know, a uh, more secure workplace, then obviously you're going to get better performance. How do we do that? Uh, we need to provide support, to provide very nice organizational climate for our workers to work in. And that's where compassionate leadership comes in. If you are a leader with compassion, you now compassion actually is not a very nice feeling. We, in, in Buddhism, there's always this talk about um, the for uh, Brahma Viharas, you know, the dwelling of the divine ones. The four Brahma Viharas, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeka. We talk a lot about Metta, loving kindness. I prefer to call Metta friendliness because it's easier for a lot of people, especially who are new to the idea of Metta. When you talk about friendliness, we know how it feels like. It's friendly, it's nice and warm. We generate that warmth to others. All in good, nice. But when it comes to karuna, compassion, um, I find that it is so, just like how we sell metta, the idea of metta, we sell the idea of compassion as something nice and fluffy uh, to have compassion for other people. But if you look closely, compassion can be a very, very painful feeling because you see suffering and you have this strong want to end that suffering, to help the person or being that's suffering, to reduce the suffering. And in order for you to want to do that, you also take on a bit of your suffering. I wouldn't say all, but because you see them suffer, you also suffer, and you have got this strong desire in you to want to end their suffering. And this desire can come in a form of pain, sadness, grief. All right, it's not something nice to feel. And that's why we find that a lot of people rather not have compassion because it's too painful. So this is just um, a disclaimer that I'm making so that uh, you, you don't see compassion. I mean, you see compassion more realistically. But we need compassion as a leader so that we are able to see what other people are going through and we try to provide as much comfort for them to reduce the suffering. And in the work setting, we want to be able to foresee or at least understand the system well enough to know how we can provide assistance, support, all right, in, in areas that would affect mental well-being and to 
provide and prolong mental wellness. Like I said earlier, uh, I didn't follow up. Sorry, I got, you know, uh, caught up with other ideas. That's how my mind works somehow. It's all over the place, which is why I need to pr practice more mindfulness. Anyway, I said that a person with a diagnosis of a particular disorder doesn't always show their um, symptoms. And because they don't always show their symptoms, they also show a lot of wellness. And what we want to be able to do is to prolong that wellness as long as possible so that they show less and less symptoms. And we can do that as um, a, a supportive social environment. We want to prolong that wellness. So it's not just about addressing the illness. We want to prolong wellness. It's also the other side of the coin to look at that we tend to forget. So compassionate leadership would be this. Whatever wellness you see, you don't want to take for granted. You want to prolong it for as long as you can. Just because you see happy employees doesn't mean they're, going, they're not going to be unhappy later on. You want to prolong that well-being. I wouldn't even say happiness because happiness to me, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm being cynical, but it's, it's a cliche because happiness is a moment that you can try to prolong, but you know that it doesn't last. So I will focus more on overall wellness. If we can prolong wellness by putting things in place that prevents uh, that wellness from becoming uh, illness, then you know you try to do it as much as possible. It's cheaper anyway. Remember, I talked to you about treatment of mental illness. It's very expensive. You don't want to get there, so you want to prevent as much as possible by prolonging the wellness. <clears throat> okay. I need to go a bit quicker. I went ahead of myself again by talking about compassion. Um, what is compassion? You should know by now, but I covered it. So I'm going to go to mental health literacy. <clears throat> compassion for myself, I'm going to drink water now. All right. <clears throat> I'm not used to talking so much, although I'm supposed to. So what is mental health literacy? It is basically these points. And I would welcome you to now take a screenshot of this because it's very important. Well, you could have screenshot my other screen. Also, it doesn't matter. You can sell it. If you earn any from it, I get 10%, yeah? <laughs> Royalty. Anyway, it's free for you to use. No problem. I don't own this information. It's for Excuse all. It's uh, why it's mental health for all. Excuse me, Prof. Elvin. Uh, yes, your, Bobby. Your slides are not on. My slides are not on? Yeah. Oh, so you haven't been seeing anything? Nope. Ha! Huh. All right. Oh, I haven't shared. That's right. Sorry, not so mindful there. Oops. Ah, <laughs> yes, I was sharing my slides. Thank you so much, Brother Bobby. Mm. All right, here you go. Ta-da! Finally makes sense now. Oh, there's something. <laughs> Apologies, yeah? All right. Now... Before going to, let me show you the previous slide. So that's the first thing. And then there's World Mental Health Day. Anybody want to take a picture of this? Mental Health at the Workplace. I've covered all of this already, community empowerment. Hopefully my points were clear enough before. Um, and those who actually want these slides, I'm happy to share them. So I'll share them with BGF. You can get my slides from them later. So healthy workplace, I've covered this. This is what I meant by healthy workplace. Uh, why to this topic I covered. Compassion, and now we have got this one, mental health literacy. So thank you again, Brother Bobby, for letting me know that the slides are not showing. Anyway, here you get to see. Mental health literacy, like what I explained earlier, is the knowledge and understanding of what health is about, and in this case, mental health. So what in What's included in mental health literacy for you to want to have better health men, uh, mental health literacy? Firstly, it is to understand what mental health is. I briefly covered what it is earlier. Mental health is about having your mental capacities working in a way that is good enough, that is adequate for you to function daily. All right? You have got enough rest that you can concentrate on what you're supposed to do, solve problems, make decisions. All right, to think, 
all those contribute to your mental health. Another bit that, that shows you are mentally healthy is you know how to manage your emotions. Meaning, not just pushing your emotions away, that's not managing your emotions. Managing emotions is about understanding what you're feeling and knowing what to do about it. So while you're feeling upset, you are mindful you're upset, you know you're upset because of certain reasons, and you know you're able to do something about it. And you understand also that your emotions will not just go away just like that. That is mental health literacy, understanding what mental health is. Another bit to understand what uh, mental health is, or other part of mental health literacy, is understanding that you need mental health. There is no health without mental health, because health is mental and physical. Mental health literacy is also knowing about common mental health problems. So I suggest you get educated in it. There are all kinds of information that you can get online. I, I would suggest uh, the American Psychological Association, or APA, or the British Psychological Society. They've got tons of information on their website. These two are enough already. If you want to be Australian, also can. There's the Australian Psychological Society, APS. Look for them. Their websites are wonderful. They've got all kinds of information. You can go to them because they are trusted websites. I'm saying this because there are all kinds of other websites out there that may not be evidence-based, so be careful. Coming back to the points here, apart from knowing about mental health problems, it is also very useful to understand the risk factors that can lead to mental health problems. Knowing how to access mental health services, also important. And being empowered, it means you know how to find resources on mental health and mental health services. I've given you a resource already just now website. APA, BPS, APS. And uh, knowing how to access mental health services. Do you know how to access in this country, in Malaysia? Don't know? That's how we need to find out. You can talk to me, but today I'm not going to cover so much on this. And you are actually empowered to actually seek help from a mental health professional. If you can seek help from a medical doctor for sore throat, you should be also be able to seek help from a mental health professional if you have got any troubles that you would like to address. In fact, you don't even have to wait until you've got any troubles. You can see the mental health professionals to be better. There's such thing as thriving to get better at things. So mental health professionals is not just about treating illness. It's also uh, promoting health. So think of it that way. It's actually an attitude to have. If you have good mental health literacy, you have got good attitudes towards mental health and mental illness. So that's the last point, positive attitude towards mental health promotion, which means Talking more about mental health. All right. What's mental health, mental illness? I'm basically covered. Again, going ahead of myself just now, we know about mental health. You've got this sense of purpose, ability, energy, direction. You feel a sense of belonging. So social health is also part of mental health. That means you've got good friends around you. You feel belonging. You feel that you're relevant. All these are very important part of mental health. You find that those people who are mentally ill tend to feel that they don't belong, tend to feel that they're useless, and tend to feel because they're useless, they're not relevant, so they don't belong. So these are the three things that are also very, very important. Sense of belongingness that comes from sense of relevance, that comes from sense of self-efficacy, that you know that you can, you've got some kind of skill there. But what is mental illness is basically a dysfunction of mental functioning, all right? that leads to a lot of distress in you that can also cause distress in other people. And in some mental illness, you don't have the distress part, you, are, you distress other people for a very significant amount of time. So it reduces your independent functioning. That's where you have a mental illness that's caused by something mental. All right? Some common ones are like depression, bipolar disorder means it's a manic depression. You can go high and low and high and low and not much time in between. All kinds of anxiety disorders, such as uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, phobic disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, all right? And then there's, of course, substance use, which is also very common. Um, sleep disorders, burnout. I'm gonna cover burnout after this. All right, so a quick check. Are you more tired than usual at work? I am. Are you making all kinds of mistakes that you don't normally make before? I am. Uh, so I take two already. Are you having difficulties motivating yourself to go to work? 
yes, me too. I took leave tomorrow, so I don't want to go to work. Haha. <laughs> Are you managing time poorly? I am managing time poorly now already. Already 10.45 and I am not even halfway through. So we'll see what happens. Uh, more impatient and short-tempered? Yeah, I am. Ask my wife. Uh, not that I shout at her, but you know, she can see that you know, I get upset very fast. Uh, isolating myself? Yeah, I, I'd rather work from home. I don't really want to you know, meet with people. Easily distracted? You saw me getting distracted early on already, which is why I'm not managing my time very well. Am I procrastinating more? Uh, well, in a way, yeah. Uh, I only prepared these slides like maybe 10 minutes before talking just now, so I rushed. Um, and I'm already surprised that I actually make any sense. Uh, so procrastinating more, rushing every day, feeling like fed up and not really caring much about work anymore. I must admit, I do feel all of this. And guess what? If you do feel all of these too, you are likely to be burnt out. And a bit more checks. Do you have difficult emotions that are stopping you from getting on with life? Like you just don't do anything anymore. You're fed up. Uh, is your appetite ex um, you know, <clears throat> affected? Mine is. Um, I tend to not eat very much if I'm like bothered or stressed up. Uh, is your sleep disturbed? Your sleep is one of the telltale signs. If you're, you're sleeping more or sleeping yet less than usual, those are signs. Eating more than usual, eating less than usual, those are also signs. All right? Um, you're having a big impact on the people you live with in a negative way, and not a positive way. You know, your mood's affected over a few weeks. You feel like you want to quit your job. Or worse, even ending your life because of all this stress. You are likely to be quite severely burnt out. All right? Here's, here's burnout. What is it? Um, it is characterized by feelings of energy depletion, meaning you're exhausted, you're tired, you have difficulties focusing. Yeah, you have mental distance from your job. You have reduced professional efficiency, efficacy on and efficiency. So basically, you're exhausted. You've got physical stress effects, headache, migraine, things like that. You are cynical and numb about your work. And then you've got reduced productivity and performance. Plus, you ruminate, meaning you worry a lot, worry, worry, worry. All right? That's burnout. And burnout is an actual condition, according to uh, the World Health Organization. And this is their publication that tells you about all kinds of diseases. The international classification of diseases includes burnout. So if you take a lot of what I showed you just now, you are likely to be burnt out. I would suggest you seek help. I seek help. I may be trained as a clinical psychologist, but I am not immune to mental health issues, conditions, and problems. So I'm seeing a psychologist at the Sunway Medical Center, and this is part of a wonderful initiative by Sunway University and Sunway Group to have Employee Assistance Program. Short for it is EAP, all right? Employee Assistance Program is usually an outsourced um, platform or outsourced um, uh, company or organization that provides mental health support to employees at any organization. And this mental health support is 100% anonymous, which means your human resource de department will not know whether you've accessed the service or not. Just that the company will have paid one lump sum to this employee assistance um, company, and they would see employees for free. So I don't have to pay for my sessions with a psychologist where I need to you know, figure things out. Uh, so you see, I am happy to share with you that I'm actually seeing a psychologist. And this is from burnout. How do I know I'm burnt out? I take all those things because I know what burnout is. When I realized and noticed that I'm showing symptoms, I did a burnout scale and my scores were through the roof. And I thought, okay, I need to do something about this. So that's part of mental health literacy. You find that you have got certain things you need to deal with, you just do it. You don't wait any further. All right. So burnout is specifically a phenomena that is at work. It's due to the work setting and shouldn't be applied to other parts of life. Because when, I'm, when I come home, and I'm, uh, uh, you know, myself with family, friends on a weekend, no problem. I'm okay. I function very well. But when I get to the work setting is where the stress is so great that I have difficulties functioning. All right. That's burnout. So what are some risk factors that affects mental health in the workplace? 
you must think that risk factors are always uh, an interaction between all kinds of factors, biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors. All these constantly interact and it reflects your lifestyle. Uh, other factors I have already mentioned earlier, technological advancement. You know, we are now in Industry 4.0. What is Industry 4.0? It is the fourth industrial revolution where we have gone to the digital age. If you cannot cope with things digital, you're going to be stressed out. What used to be on our desk are all in our phones or our other gadgets now. So if you're unable to move with the change, it's very stressful and the change is going very fast. So I mentioned this earlier already, high, lots of change, high stress, low productivity, affects mental health, affects physical health because there is a very close link between mental health and physical health. You find that you're stressed up all the time, your physical body would be affected. Your GI or gastrointestinal uh, tract would be affected. You get all kinds of gastric juices coming out, you're likely to get gastritis, all right? You start probably to have more pimples because of the stress. You start losing hair, start getting white hair. All kinds of things can affect your physical health when your mental health is uh, not functioning well. So other risk factors, this is according to the World Health Organization, especially within work settings, all right? If you don't have proper health and policy, health and safety policies at work, that's a risk factor because no one knows what to do when there's a health problem or a mental health problem. There's poor communication within the organization, you know, there's maybe unfair treatment or perceived unfair treatment, not good. So if you are managers, I would really encourage you to take a screenshot of this. All right, very important. If your employees don't have very much participation in decision making, things are, uh, decision are made for you all the time and you have no control, feeling out of control is not nice at work. Don't have very much support for employees. Um, high workload, which is everywhere nowadays, can't really do much about it, but at least if you can provide some support, that would help. Very inflexible working hours, especially in this day and age of working from home, all right, where you're, you're supposed to work 24 seven again. Very unclear roles in the organization or you don't understand the organization strategies or you know, uh, in terms of planning and a way forward. So you just simply do anything. It's very, uncomfortable to have uncertainty. So as an organization, if you can improve as much certainty as possible, there are policies, there are flow charts that people know about, you know exactly what to do when there's a crisis, things like that, you know who to report to, things are clear, as clear as possible, you actually reduce a lot of stress, all right? And the last one, linked to personal stigma towards mental health issues, basically, if the organization is very stigmatized against mental health kind of conversations, all the more not friendly for any kind of mental health help. If you get big bosses making fun of crazy people, depressed people are useless and things like that, you're creating a very toxic environment for anyone who might want to seek help for their mental health. So think about that carefully. You will need to address the stigma and talk about mental health in a more positive um, attitude. All right, now, what can we do to manage mental health issues at the workplace? Like I said earlier, we have to address the stigma, the negative stigma, to show that, you know, mental health issues are okay. I've just given myself an example, uh, as an example for you, so that you can see that it doesn't have to be uh, a bad thing. It affects all of us. No one is immune, whether you like it or not. If you have any issues, you can't actually seek help. So if we can have a conducive work environment that provides that kind of support, that would be very helpful. And then um, if we can improve confidential communication, meaning trust, we need to have very good sense of trust at the workplace. Without trust, when there's mistrust, you get a lot of anxiety people would feel insecure and they don't want to engage with you. That becomes a very toxic environment again. Can you imagine going to work and you don't trust anybody? Not nice. So 
we need to put into place in any kind of organization the element of trust, integrity, compassion. I'm going to bring compassion back now because if you're making fun of people who may have a mental health issue, that's not having compassion. That is being self-centered and I would say, you know, toxic. It's not nice. So you can create an environment in your organization and slash or you can engage professional consultants like what I mentioned earlier, employee assistance program. Now, there are quite a few employee assistance program companies in Malaysia. If you don't know about them, just Google EAP and Malaysia, see what kind of things come up. All right. But do check out, make sure that they are legit companies. If you're not too sure, you can contact me. I'm quite easily found. In fact, I can give you my email address later. And it will be good to also know this thing called psychological first aid. A lot of companies these days are helping their staff to get trained in psychological first aid. We know first aid, physical one, but do we know psychological first aid? What is this? It is basically to address crisis. If any member of your staff has got some kind of crisis, we can actually use psychological first aid on them to help them manage their crisis. All right. To some of you, this is probably the first time you're hearing all these things. I purposely want to put this in because it's very important. You should start thinking about it, especially those of you who are managers. Start telling your bosses, or if you're the boss, start talking about these two things, EAP and PFA. EAP may be too expensive for you. Unless you are a big organization, you may not be able to afford EAP. But if you can, I would really strongly suggest that you go for it. And get your staff, you know, some of your staff trained in PFA so that they can train others and they can also help uh, anyone who's having any problems. And this is the other thing. I also addressed this earlier already. But you don't look stressed up. You know, I talk about me going to see the psychologist. And you probably think, but you don't look stressed up. I mean, you're a psychologist. How, how can you be going to, to seek help from counselors, psychologists, psychotherapists, or psychiatrists, right? See, the thing is, people who are troubled inside don't look it outside. Mental illness has a face. That face looks just like you and me, right? And you don't want to be waiting until things get worse to the point that you start looking like a typical mentally ill person. You don't want to be looking that way because once you start looking that way, it's pretty serious already. All right, you don't need to be troubled. Like I said, you can focus on flourishing to get better. So good mental health is not just about getting from mentally ill to mentally well. Good mental health is also about maintaining that mental health to continue being resilient. Resilient is very important. And we all would need help every now and then. We are human beings. That's fine. It's part of being human, isn't it? I mean, if you are practicing Buddhist, you will understand that life is suffering and you will suffer. So sometimes you suffer physically, sometimes you suffer mentally, sometimes you suffer both. So we need to do something about it. And part of what we know to maintain good health is also through meditation. Meditation is used not to counter mental illness, it is to prolong mental health. If you're feeling very depressed, you start meditating, your meditation doesn't, probably doesn't go very well. So what's best is always meditate when you can meditate, when you are calm and peaceful, meditate. Don't wait until you are angry when you start meditating. It's not going to work very well. So that's why practice is practice is practice. Don't wait until you feel something not nice and then only you start doing it. It's too late. Just like taking vitamin C when you already have sore throat. You already have a sore throat. You know, vitamin C, yeah, well, may help here and there, but it is not treatment. It's supposed to be maintenance, right? Okay, so if you know of anyone who wants to go and seek help, don't stop them. Please encourage them because they are having good mental health literacy and so should you. There's no shame, yeah? No shame in, in seeking help. Like I'm showing you right now, am I feeling shameful? You might feel shame for me, but that's your problem, not mine. I'm happy just sharing with you because I know it's good for me. And mental health is everyone's responsibility. Please support each other as much as possible. Let's break the stigma. Let's keep on talking about mental health. All right, it's 11 o'clock now. I'm just going to quickly go through um, the slide so that we can have more Q&A. I'm sorry I took this long. I have planned for just 45 minutes, but mm, I talk too much sometimes. But hopefully, whatever much I've been talking about has been helpful to you. Now, this is a very important um, figure to look at. 
this is called the illness wellness continuum. At any point of time, we are on this continuum. All right, we can be well, we can be unwell. And at the end of the premature death is death, lah, you die. All right, and high level wellness, we slide up and down on this. But it depends on where you want to face. If you're facing high level wellness, all your behaviors need to be contributing towards wellness, regardless of wherever you are on the continuum. You can be at the blue side and still be facing forward. That means you're practicing good health, including mental health. If you are on the other end, if you even, for example, have terminal cancer, but you are facing forward, meaning you have got a very positive attitude, growth attitude, you know how to manage your pain well, manage your uh, emotions well, you can accept your pain, accept your emotions. That's being healthy emotionally because you don't let it um, disable you too much. You're already disabled. You don't disable yourself even further. All right? So something for you to think about. And this will be my last one, already my last slide. This is very much in uh, the idea of any kind of occupational, healthy and, uh, occupational health and safety. Managing with mindfulness and compassion, how do we practice it in terms of occupational health and safety? Those of you who are familiar with OHS, which is occupational health and safety, there's this hierarchy model. Hierarch stands for hazard identification, meaning risk identification. You are able to know the risk. And then you can assess the risk. Is it um, supposed to be managed at a point of time or can you prevent it from happening? And then there's also risk control if it is there. So if you are a compassionate leader, you will want to look for all of this as soon as possible and try to prevent any risk from getting worse. So there's mental health hazard. Normally with OHS, we only focus on physical risk but I would really encourage you to focus also on psychological risk. All right, what are the hazards at the work? And I mentioned earlier already, if you don't have the policy, you've got a very high discrimination and environment is, is toxic, very poor communication, that's high risk. You go to survey any of your uh, employees on, on burnout, whether they've got mental health literacy or not, are they okay with their jobs? Do they have any existing mental health problems? If you don't know all these things, how are you going to provide help? All right. And then once you've identified this, you need to know what are the next steps. What are the methods of managing risk? I've given you earlier some of the points from WHO. Support interventions. There is employee assistance program. Providing more information about mental health. All right. At Sunway University, we provide tons of information about mental health. At the back of toilet doors, we put it there because while you're sitting down and doing business, you can read. So we are exposing a lot of people to better mental health literacy because the university is very stressful for both staff and students. Now even more stressful because things are online. We have got all kinds of SOPs, all right, for the social distancing. All of that can be very stressful. So even before COVID also, we provide that because at a private university, students are very high stress because you know, parents pay lots of money. There's a lot of demand for very, very high performance. So mental health is something we really promote. And then evaluation would be every end of the year when we want to see whether it works or not. That's true audit. Although audit in itself can be a very stressful thing, but your, if your understanding of audit is correct, you're not going to be too stressed out by audit because it's about finding out the truth. And if the truth is something we need that shows that we need to improve, then we just improve. No, we are not 100%. Audit should not be 100%, otherwise there's no need for audit. There's no such thing as perfection. So it's about quality assurance and positive impact. So if you see audit in a very negative light, then you don't really understand growth. And sorry to say that, but you know, you really need to understand that we all need to grow, we all need to improve, and every now and then you're gonna find something that's a risk that you need to address. All right. Um, and then, how are we going to sustain this? Things are always going to change. Can you manage that change? So back to compassionate leadership, you want to be looking at all of these things. It's not easy doing, being a leader, yeah? but you need to take the initiative to understand this and to provide whatever help you can
to your employees. And in this case, focusing more on mental health, adding it to whatever you do for physical health. So in summary, finally got to it. Mental health literacy, very important. Please get educated, get savvy about it. Uh, good mental health comes from compassionate management. Occupational health and safety should lead to a sense of well-being and security physically and mentally. And I really urge you to put the mental back into health. Mental, it's a very important part of health. That sense of well-being, sense of belonging, sense of security. Very important to have. And it's not just about improving mental health from illness. It's also about thriving, about moving forward, to be continually empowered to do something about it. And do not be ashamed whenever you see the word mental. It is okay. It's part of us. It's part of you. Part of everybody. So there's no shame in it. And to move towards all kinds of healthy contributions at work to improve your productivity, improve overall economy. Because if you are productive, our economy as a country improves. Economy improve, quality of life improve. And it's not just for our country, but we can help other countries here and there as well. We help each other. So whether we like it or not, we live in a system. And if you want to have a comfortable life in our own unit, the units around us have to also be healthy. All right, there you go. That's it from me. And I'm happy to feel any questions from you. So I'm gonna unshare now. And then, um, yeah, we can see the questions. All right, thanks. Over to you, Brother Bobby. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Edwin, for the wonderful sharing and for the very frank and enthusiastic uh, stand on mental health. Now, look, I'm still waiting for questions, but there's a, a comment, an interesting comment from uh, our Muslim brother, oh, great. in Ahmad. Great. Yeah, he says there are almost 4 million people having mental health problems in Malaysia, but the majority of our people take likely only. Yes, you're right. This is why I'm giving this talk, to tell all of you to not take mental health lightly. It's very important. If your mental health is not good, your physical health will suffer eventually. It can suffer very quickly. Think about when you are happy and you know it, you know, other than clapping your hands, you probably will go to the toilet quite easy and quite okay. When you're stressed up, you either get constipated or you, you get tummy ache. That's how it works on the body. So a healthy mind is a healthy body. Even if the body is unhealthy, a healthy mind is something that can go help you manage um, your body. And this comes from a lot of research here. Yeah? And I like to go back to research because it's not about testimony, it's about science. Science tells us that even if you're having a terminal illness such as cancer, your outcome, your treatment outcome will be facilitated by your mental health. If your mental health is not good, the outcome of your physical treatment also is, is not so good. And those who have uh, gone into remission, meaning you successfully treat the cancer. If you live mentally well, you are less likely to get a relapse. Whereas those who continue to be very stressed out, you know, have a very negative attitude, they are more likely to get a relapse. That's how serious mental health is to your physical health. So we all need to play our roles to manage our mental health and to help each other with their mental health. And um, I'm, I'm glad to, I mean, it doesn't matter what religion you are in. I'm, I'm glad that, I mean, it's a bit controversial perhaps, especially in Malaysia to have a, a Muslim listening in here. I'm, I'm glad that we can all be open-minded. Um, and I am familiar with uh, Muslim aspects of mental health and physical health. And to me, if you ask me, it's wonderful. You've got a different four steps that, that kind of like reflects what we talk about in Buddhism on enlightenment as well. Uh, so um, in every religion, I find that there's a lot to do with physical and mental health together in Christianity. 
if you look at the seven day Adventists, they are very much about health and not just physical health. Uh, it's also about mental health, which is why you find there's a lot of health food that's produced by Adventist movement in Christianity. And they, uh, like for example, Sanitarium, the brand from Australia is an Adventist brand. They got wheat bakes, very healthy. They focus on being healthy and it, if you can believe, a lot of Adventists are vegetarian. So they focus on health seriously, including mental health. So there you are, you're going to talk about religion, it's all there. There's nothing exclusive. Okay, the, uh, the Prof. Edwin, there's another question <clears throat> from uh, Ben Hoy. On, uh, can you explain more on PFA application at our work? All right, thank you very much for asking that. You know, I just mentioned it very briefly. PFA, all right, Psychological First Aid, uh, basically helps people, people understand what to do when another person is uh, in distress. So it's very basic health skills to manage or help another person who is in uh, mental distress to address it. So um, one is about teaching stress management. Secondly, is about teaching uh, stress prevention. Um, I'm just giving you very, very basic points on it. You know, you need to go have, have a look at it. In fact, you can find all this information very easily online. So the other one is to help um, the individual. Um, you know, the managed stress bit is very practical. It's like breathing exercises, relaxing, practicing relaxation uh, as often as possible so that you prolong your well-being. Uh, the breathing exercise is to calm down and to start identifying resources for help. So it's not just about the moment that you address your stress, but it's also about how you can continue being as well as possible, as long as possible. At the same time, identify where you can go for help, who you can talk to for help, all right? These things, once you identify, it's easier then to know what to do. So that's the step. And after that would be to help the individual know how to continue being well. So what are the things you put in place to continue being well? In uh, psychology, we call this behavior activation. What can you do, all right? For example, in Buddhism, we talk about meditation. Walking meditation, sitting meditation, meditation is all part of maintaining wellness. So you can uh, fill in your daily timetable with pleasurable activities by yourself, with other people. So the more pleasurable activities you have in a day, you automatically have a better day. Ta-da! All right? And in Buddhism, we, let's practice the four Brahma Viharas. Metta. If you produce more friendliness to people in a day just by greeting, hello! When somebody greets you, how do you feel? Kind of nice, isn't it? So the more greeting you give people in a day, automatically your day will be better already. That's active behavior um, initiatives to, to do those kind of things. So, um, that's, in a nutshell, what PFA is all about. Addressing the stress, knowing who, who to, where, where to find help, uh, maintaining that wellness as much as possible. And then, uh, last thing I forgot to mention, teach others. When you start teaching others, you are automatically practicing. You have to practice, otherwise how do you teach others? Just like in meditation, unless you meditate yourself, how are you gonna be teaching meditation? Because you don't know how it feels like. So, PFA, I find it's a very sustainable way of improving mental health literacy in people. You're training PFA, you provide PFA, the one who gets a PFA can also do PFA on other people. So it's, it's like a, a you know, ripple effect. I hope that's uh, clear enough. Yeah, okay. You. Okay, uh, uh, I think I can read the questions, uh, Brother Bobby. Yeah. So how to answer this question every Sunday night? Mom, can we not go to work tomorrow? Uh, you can answer with a very positive, yes, you cannot go to work tomorrow. That's okay. But huh? <laughs> if you don't go to work, the consequences are this and this and this and this and this. Are you prepared to address all these things? If you're not prepared, I suggest you go to work first and think about how to prepare for all these things. Answer is always yes. Can you do this for me? Yeah, sure, I can. But huh? if I do this for you, I'm unable to do this and this and this. That will also affect you. So how? Let's negotiate. Rather than saying no, because people don't like no for an answer, isn't it? It's very like, 
uh, confrontational. You say yes, but think about consequences. That's how you teach people about responsibility. So if it is your you know, son, daughter, they should be old enough to take responsibility. As soon as they're three years old, I find if you ask me when to teach responsibility as young as possible, because you get to see the consequences. So you don't get too spoiled in that sense. All right, I hope that that makes sense, Yulin. And then Teresa asking, is stress one of the causes for bipolar? It's not that easy. Like I said earlier, there's biology, psychology, and social factors for any kind of problem. Bipolar is one of them. Biologically, psychologically, and socially. Stress, yes, is a small factor that contributes to it, but it's not the only factor. A lot of people can be stressed up like crazy and not have bipolar. So how do you explain that? All right. Um, so we need to be very careful about pointing the finger to, ah, must be stress. It doesn't work that way, all right? When it comes to mental health, it's just like physical health. Can you say it's because you're exposed to cold that you get a cold? No, a lot of people are uh, exposed to cold a lot and they don't get a cold. Depends on whether there's a virus there or not. So again, biological. Now, why is it that some colds last longer? Because they're stressed up. <laughs> it's not just because they're stressed up, because there's so many other factors that come into play. We need to focus on holistic. All right, I hope that answers your, your question. And then what's the treatment and solution for burnout? Again, it's a whole bunch of things that you need to be doing. Taking care of your physical health taking care of your mental health by you know, behaving in a way that helps you physically, behaving in a way that helps you mentally. So treatment and solution for burnouts. Uh, learn PFA, psychological first aid on yourself. Learn how to manage stress. Learn how to uh, know where to go to for help. Learn how to um, you know, put in beneficial, pleasurable activities in a day. Learn how to um, develop more beneficial kind of thoughts. Practice them, beneficial thinking. It doesn't happen overnight. You just have to practice and practice and practice. So all of these things together, eat healthily, sleep well. You don't have enough sleep, you're gonna be burned out very quickly. So you see what I mean by all these factors come into play is biological, psychological, and social have more um, social connection that are helpful for you, that are healthy for you. Social support is also very important. So biopsychosocial, all these things have to come into play for you to treat and to solve burnout. At the same time, you need to understand that burnout will happen again. It doesn't go away totally. It comes and it goes and it comes and it goes. Talk to monks. You think they are nice and relaxed? Mm -mm. Not all the time. Living in a mon monastery with all kinds of personalities of monks or nuns, uh, they get affected too. Monks and nuns are human beings. We are all not immune to burnout. So we have got very high functioning monks who are expected to do more and more and more like Ajahn Brahm. People put demands on him like crazy and he tries to please everybody. Um, he's likely to suffer from burnout and he had. I was his uh, kapia before, I know. And the thing good about Ajahn Brahm is that he knows what to do about it. He knows how to, you know, go to a nice isolated place, meditate, recoup. So he's got very good mental health literacy. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Um, is short tempered another sign of burnout? It could be. All right. The thing about uh, symptoms, anger, um, uh, being very emotional, it, it doesn't mean that having that symptom must be burnout. All right. What we say in psychology is we use the term transdiagnostic symptoms. A lot of symptoms that you see are in many other diagnoses. So you cannot just say, aha, you are very angry. You have got, you know, short temper must be burnout. No, not so easy. What is more important is not to identify a particular symptom thinking that it has to be some kind of diagnosis. What's more important is to address the symptom. How can you address that temper? How can you manage that temper? When you manage the temper, you basically address your well-being. 
So it's not necessary to have a particular diagnosis. I wouldn't wait, I'll address it straight away. The other transdiagnostic symptom is rumination, over worrying. If you address that worrying, you address so many other problems already at the same time because it is a transdiagnostic, it's a cross diagnosis. So focus on whatever that is um, contributing to any kind of dysfunction. You find that you start functioning better after that. All right, what is EAP again? Employee Assistance Program. EAP. Look up online, lots of information on it. And then uh, general treatment given to facing burnout. Oh, I just answered that one. Burnouts are quite common, yes. Um, Anthony Pinto asks, how do we measure level of mental health at work, at home, in families? There are all kinds of measures that you can use that are free, that you can download online. One of, uh, uh, one, one good measure is the DAS that even our Ministry of Health uses. The DAS stands for Depression, Anxiety, and Stress Scale. D-A-S-S. There is the 21 question version. That's DAS 21. There is the 42 version question, which is longer. Which not many people want to feel so many questions. All right. They give you feedback as to how stressed, how anxious, how depressed you are. But it's not to, it's not to diagnose. Yeah? It's a screening tool to give you feedback. So that's on not so good emotions. You can also use the mask lock. Let me type in here. I hope you all can get it. Send to everyone. Mask lock burnout inventory. Right? The mask lock burnout inventory tells you how burnt out you are. So you just do that. The scoring is explained uh, under the inventory. You can download this, it is free online. Uh, so that tells you how burnout you are. Go for treatment or treat yourself and then fill it in again to see whether your scores reduce or not. Okay. So these are some of the ways that you can monitor, you can measure. Um, just look online, uh, screening tool for well-being. You know, there is a happiness scale, even five questions only, happiness scale. Um, it's called the satisfaction with life scale. It's very general. Um, and then there are all kinds of well-being scale, quality of life scale that you can use. Tons of them online. How do you address guilty feeling when we can see others in need emotionally, but you yourself are too overwhelmed to reach out? Very good question. Excellent. Thank you so much for asking that. The answer is partially self-compassion. You have compassion towards others. If you are too overwhelmed, Give it to yourself first. Take care of yourself first. If you're flown before in airplanes, you would see the same advice. When the oxygen mask comes down and you want to help a kid next to you, what do you do? You put it on yourself first. And then you are, when you're feeling better, you're able to manage, then you help. It's okay to not be able to help. I see that every day. So many times I want to help, I want to do something, I want to take action. Don't be a hero, because when you watch all the superhero movies, heroes get affected too. A lot of our superheroes don't have mental health literacy, or they're very bad. Even Superman, they do not know how to manage their feelings very well. That's why he fights with Batman. Both of them, misunderstanding, very poor mental health literacy. You need to take care of yourself first. It's very, very important. Be kind to yourself. You want to have compassionate to, compassion towards others, use it on yourself. When you have compassion inside, it's so much easier than to be compassionate to other people. If you still want to help and you can't help, get others to help. Tell others, hey, look, you know, I would like to help out here. I can't do it. Can you please do it for me? That's what I do as well. A lot of times I want to help, I cannot. And uh, we need to be resourceful. If you can't help, find others you think who can help, get them to help. If they can't help, get them to do the same thing, find others to help. Eventually, there will be someone who can help. And I think this is what BGF does well, isn't it? We, we gather, we crowdsource to, to provide some kind of help here and there. It's basically about being resourceful. Being resourceful is also part of mental health literacy. So I hope I have uh, answered you, Cheng Sim. And then Ashley asks, how do you tell politely friends 
that their behavior over the years have become toxic until a person rather stay away. It is tricky. It is tricky to tell them because sometimes they are toxic and they don't know it and they don't have the insight to know it. Those are the more toxic people. So um, if you can tell them they still don't get it, in fact, they become more toxic to you, then you know, it's probably beneficial to stay away from them. But some people who are toxic and don't know it and who have the good insight, you can let them know and how to tell them politely. Um, sometimes I'm blunt, I say, look, uh, have you noticed that sometimes the things you say and everything upset people? What, what do you think about that? That can be also be a polite way. You're asking them uh, for their opinion. So do you notice that? Because I notice that and I'm wondering whether you notice it as well. And I'm wondering if we can manage this together. So you're offering help. You know, you're, not, you're not telling people that you have to change because you have been very toxic, it's very bad. Um, <clears throat> Somehow using the you and pointing doesn't really help. It's more about, hey, you know, I, I noticed this. And uh, I noticed that when it happens, it upsets you as well. I'm wondering what we can do about it. Is there a way? Can we find the solutions together? No, when a person stayed away to manage their own mental health, don't want to have unpleasant talks with others and comments, friends think the ones who stay away are the ones who have issues. Uh, I'm not too sure what you mean here, but let me try to get... Uh, it again by reading it. When the person stayed away to manage their own mental health, okay, as in they don't want their unpleasant talks and comments to have an effect. Okay, friends think the one who stayed away are the ones who are having the issues. Uh, well, the thing is, if you think, you may not know. And if you don't know, the best thing to do is ask. You know, it's like I, I, I noticed that you have been staying away from us. Is there anything that we can help you with? You know, is there anything wrong? No, would you like to talk about it? Open up the conversation. If you don't know us rather than um, promoting fake news, we don't know. If you don't know us, don't assume. All right, I hope that helps. It's not an easy one to do, but it takes practice. And it's a good thing to start more conversations about toxic uh, friends or toxic behaviors. Often it is not the person who is toxic, it's the behavior that's toxic, just that they don't know it is being toxic to other people and behaviors can change. All right, Yu Ming asks, uh, how can anyone overcome depression by applying Buddha's Dhamma? Oh, wow, all right, uh, you. You know, one thing is you need to understand depression is also affected by biology. It is in interaction with, again, psychology and social. Buddha's Dhamma helps a lot with psychology and social, so psychosocial. It may, in some sense, also affect the biology of the person, but it may take some time. So what you can do by applying Buddha's Dhamma in, in um, addressing depression is a lot of um, main bits. I would go straight to the Four Noble Truths. Go for the basic stuff. There's suffering, there's the cause of suffering, the end of suffering is the way to end suffering. And the way to end suffering is by practicing the Eightfold Noble Path. Right understanding, right thought, right speech. Um, Mm. right action livelihood effort mindfulness and concentration although i would rather use the word stillness than concentration because concentration can give you more stress when you try to concentrate right? be still so practice the eightfold noble path and of course the very basic five precepts a lot of people don't see how it affects um, mental health but it does if you refrain from killing, you're less likely to feel <laughs> guilty for killing, isn't it? Less guilt, better mental health. Refrain from stealing, same thing. If you steal, you're likely to feel guilty. You protect yourself from feeling that guilt, you're less likely to be depressed. Um, actually, the five precepts deals with guilt quite a bit, you know? Uh, uh, refraining from sexual misconduct. Ta-da, no need to feel guilty. Uh, lying, same thing, guilt. And of course, uh, fifth precept, you don't um, get addicted to substances that would make you less mindful. Practicing the five precept can deal with depression, can reduce depression. I'm not saying cure, yeah? it addresses depression. I hope that helps. And then of course, the whole idea of loba, dosa, and moha, greed, hatred, delusion. You're greedy, Unlikely to, to maintain your depression. Hatred, 
or all the more, right? Self-explanatory delusions. That's a bit more difficult because all of us are deluded. And this whole idea of um, attachment um, and impermanence, anatta. Impermanence, if you understand impermanence, you can let go of more things easier, less need to be depressed. You are free. It's freedom from attachment, in a way. Anicca. Oh, what's anicca? Oh, sorry. Anicca is impermanence. Anatta is... Um, um, see, I'm not very mindful today. Tired, I guess. Burnout. Mm. Easy to blame it on burnout, isn't it? But yeah, anatta is non-self. A bit more difficult to, to um, get at, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry so much about anatta. Focus on anicca. Impermanence. So the more you... you internalize all these things, the easier it becomes to address depression. I hope that answers the question. Um, Otek Bin asks, can mental disease ever be due to spiritual cause, for example, possession? Well, uh, that's a very good question. Sometimes I forget to put the spiritual in the biopsychosocial. The biopsychosocial should also in include spiritual because applying the Buddha Dhamma is spiritual. Possession, unlikely very, very low likelihood, especially if you practice the Dhamma, even less likelihood because you're well protected uh, by your own uh, good karma that you're doing by practicing the Dhamma. It rhymes, right? Yo. Um, yes, it can maybe in a very small 0 0.00 something percentage because somehow there's been all kinds of scientific study to show that yes, there is some likelihood of possession, but uh, most of the time, no. If you talk to Dr. Pang Chengka, who's a psychiatrist and also a practicing Buddhist, he has done research on it. And, you know, even monks <laughs> say that it's unlikely. <coughs> it's more to a personal belief. So you need to be very careful about the whole idea of possession. Whatever it is, even if it is possession, you need to put all other things in place. Bio, psycho, social. Physical health, focus on it as a bio part. All right, psychosocial would be, again, um, beneficial thought, mindfulness, um, social support. All these things are very important. Provide all three, bio, psycho, and social. I hope that helps. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, the person who withdraws, oh, Bobby's asking this, a uh, voice issue, can we reach out to them or let them be? Well, um, if they withdraw, you're concerned about them, let them know. Let them know that, hey, you know, if there's anything you'd like to talk about, anything, we notice that you're withdrawing, we are here. We are here, we are listening, we care. Keep on saying that. <coughs> Eventually, you know, if they really need someone, because they know that you're there, they're more likely to reach out, rather than just letting them be. If you want to practice that compassion, let them know. Have more people say the same thing. But the more people who say the same thing creates... A, a social scaffolding around a person that a person can climb up from. <coughs> Excuse me. I hope that helps. Even if you don't say anything and you want to be there with them, just be with them. Be with them quietly. If they don't want to talk, that's fine. Don't force them to talk. Just stay with them. You know how those of you who got pets, dogs and cats, they just want to sit there with you. When you want to pet them, they go, <laughs> okay. That means they just want to be there with you. They don't want to be touched. And that's fine. That's perfectly okay. All right. Felicia is asking if a person who is always dramatic, does she have an underlying problem? First thing is, I, I would encourage you or rather discourage you from using the word always. Because they won't always be dramatic. If you watch carefully, they're not always dramatic. <coughs> there are times where they are not dramatic at all. Right? That's one thing to, to remember. And uh, if they seem that they are constantly dramatic, you know, a lot of the time they're dramatic, not always. Is there an underlying problem? Maybe. We don't know. Again, we cannot look at just one symptom and say, aha, there's a problem there. There are many triggering points. There are many uh, factors that would contribute to someone being dramatic. It would contribute to someone getting angry often. It could be how they grew up. They grew up with a family that easily shows anger, monkey see, monkey do. It's about modeling as well. That's the psycho, that's the social part. So we don't know someone's um, background. We, we cannot simply just say that it's an underlying problem. It may, it may not, it may be just the way uh, someone is. 
there's this what we call a histrionic personality they tend to be quite dramatic one everything is all drama could have been learned behavior you go look at a family maybe they are family or actors <laughs> you know they're full of drama uh, we don't know so we need to look at the bigger picture and to see how well the person is functioning the dramatic does not mean dysfunction when it comes to mental illness there must be some form of dysfunction and not just in a day it has to be a dysfunction of about two weeks to a month if you notice that seek professional help because two weeks is a very long time to be dysfunctional it tells you that you do have some kind of a problem being dramatic doesn't mean it's a problem all right hope that helps all right uh, my buddhist friend told me without converting to buddhism i can still practice buddha dhamma because it's a uh, yeah well you don't even have to call it buddha nature you know to me as a buddhist if, if i want to make this more secular you don't have to even call it buddhism because dhamma is essentially the truth that you can find in every religion if you look at it carefully if you're muslim have a look at sufism i hope you're okay with sufism because in it there are a lot of very good wisdom that you can practice for mental health for physical health it's all in there already there's so many things within islam that is very healthy <laughs> There's so many things within Christianity that's healthy. You must look beyond the short stories that people tell. You know, those are the wow factor. Like even within Buddhism, you look at the scriptures, there are a lot of wow factor, like wow, this story, that story, but you're going to take it with a pinch of salt. Focus on the practice that actually brings up the benefit. So I wouldn't worry about, you know, calling it the Buddha Dhamma. You know, that's, I find, very exclusive. We cannot be exclusive when it comes to mental health and physical health and personal practice of spirituality. Spirituality is inclusive. You bring religion into it, it becomes exclusive. We don't need to do that. You don't do that for yourself, that's fine. But if you ask me, we don't need to. We are all brothers and sisters in humanity. All right, I hope that helps, Razali. Uh, Vijay Kumar asks, could you share five things that we can do to improve our mental health? Okay, on top of our, on, on, on my mind, there are lots of things, but top five, I guess, rest. Rest and relaxation. Have time to rest, even though it's just for five minutes, give that time to yourself to just be still. Stay still. Five minutes may be too long. Sorry. Go for two minutes. How's that? Two minutes of just stillness every now and then. That's number one. Number two, practice gratitude. Being grateful. Just focus on as many things that you can be grateful for in one minute. Write it down as many as possible. The more you do every day, the more one minute of great gratitude you do every day. This has been found by research, yeah? It improves your mental health. So we have got stillness, gratitude. Um, third one, would be social circle, social health, social support, friendship. Build your friendship. Because we know from a longitudinal research, I forget whether it's Harvard or Stanford, over 50 years of study, they found that wealth is not health. Even physical health is not necessary for quality of life. Like I said, people with cancer can still have a good quality of life. You know where that comes from? Social health. Social health is very, very important. It's a number one factor for quality of life. So number three thing that you can do to uh, improve your mental health, surround yourself with good people. Very healthy. Even the Buddha said that. And Ananda said to Buddha, you know, I think, you know, um, my Lord, that uh, friendship is half of the spiritual life. And the Buddha said, no, Ananda, don't say that. Don't say that, Ananda. Friendship is the whole of physical life. So there you go. It comes from the Buddha himself. Number four, um, improve mental health would be, of course, mindfulness. I said stillness earlier, but mindfulness is uh, it's a bit more effort, but it helps being still. I know I'm jumping all over the place, but you know, it's the first thing that comes to mind. Mindfulness, practice mindfulness. It's not just about meditation, but being mindful of whatever you're doing every day. When you're more mindful, you're more mindful about your feelings. You're more mindful about where your feelings come from, where it goes. And you're mindful and aware that your feelings are all temporary and impermanence. 
of improving your mental health. And number five, what I would like to bring in is mudita. Friendships covered. Um, what else was covered just now? Never mind. Gratitude's covered. And now mudita means sympathetic joy. I would say, I would call it um, glorifying skillfulness. Look for skills in others and celebrate them. Whatever little skill. I'm now celebrating all your skill for paying attention for so long. Wow. Wonderful. Fantastic. You know, I clap. When I celebrate, when you celebrate, how does it feel in your heart? Is it nice? Do you like it? You want more of it? What can you do? Celebrate more? No? <laughs> as simple as that. Find any reason to celebrate whatever. Be inspired. Inspiration is something that gives energy. Energy is something that provides, contributes to your mental health. Think about all the times you're inspired. Who were you inspired by? Bring up that inspiration again. If you cannot, then just find inspiration in whatever you can find. I'm inspired by Brother Bobby for doing all this thing. Bobby, you may think this is something simple, no big deal, you do this every weekend, but to me it's wow, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. You see, when I'm inspired, I'm also grateful. The gratitude comes up from inspiration. Thank you so much. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Straight away, it's a nice fluffy feeling from me. Nice fluffy feeling, there's meta already, there's friendship, friendliness. So you got meta, you got murita, and of course, from there, automatically there's karuna. I want to help. So there you go, five things. I hope I've covered all five. And uh, all right, one more from So Sian Chin. Is it Chin So Sian? Well, sorry. Um, can, you, can you share how to initiate support network from colleagues at work? Easy. Just say, hey, shall we have a support group? <laughs> I'm feeling stressed out. I'm wondering whether other, other people are feeling stressed up too. Or best still, uh, share the burnout list that I told you. Hey, I'm feeling this. Anyone else feeling this? How many ticks do you have? Let's compare notes. That, wow, you got all these ticks as well. Hey, so we have a support group then. That's what I did with my workplace. I pushed for EAP at Sangbei University before they even had EAP. Every year, I get rejected. I keep on pushing. I say, look, we need the help. I keep on telling everybody about EAP. I get more support that way. And everybody also tell the HR, hey, we all want EAP. Boom, we got EAP. I say, it's a very good investment. Yes, it's a lot of money, but guess what? With EAP, we get better productivity. And with mutual support, we will also get productivity. So I suggest you share my talk with them by you telling, giving the talk yourself <laughs> and see what you get. When a person is highly stressed, one can't possibly do a lot of distress and the mind is not at peace. You are very right. How to address that? Allow them to um, you know, take their time to go towards peace. Telling someone who's angry to relax will not work. You probably get slapped in the face or something. So how can they distress? Remove themselves, remove them from the stressor. Go to a quieter place. Take a walk. Do something different. Walking helps. All right? Or go to a nice quiet corner. Basically remove yourself from that stressful situation. Surround yourself with friends, if you want to be with friends, otherwise you want to be by yourself and ruminate, sure, fine. But you find you're ruminating, ruminating too much, then distract yourself by doing something else. You know, Buddhists have got their ways of doing, like going Buddha, 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 you get inspired and you feel better after that. But not everybody can do that. Forcing people to do, do, do that will not be helpful if they don't like it. You get even more upset. Um, so don't, fo don't force yourself to meditate. Don't force yourself to sleep. Do something else that helps to calm you down. And one thing would be good to know what to do is, before you even get angry, find out what helps you to calm down. Practice, this, practice it more often, because if you are more familiar with whatever helps you to calm down, when you practice that you are fam whatever that you're familiar with, it's easier for you to calm down. And this is why meditation regularly is so important. Because meditation, whether it's for five minutes a day, all right, it's not about finding calmness. Meditation is about practicing familiarity with being still. So that when you want to be still again, it's easier to get into it. That's why I learned about meditation. It's not about to find calmness, to find stillness. It is about being still and being familiar with being still. So the next time you meditate, it's easier for you to get that stillness. All right? It's not about achieving something. It's just practicing it first. 
So I hope that helps. All right, Yu Ming has got, how can one be who is depressed be mindful? <laughs> um, again, you don't, someone who is depressed, all right, does not always feel depressed. So rather than trying to be mindful while you're depressed, practice that mindfulness when you are not depressed. By doing that, again, you become more familiar with that feeling of mindfulness that even when you're depressed, you can practice mindfulness. So don't wait until you're depressed to practice mindfulness. Do it every day, all the time, as much as possible. So that when you do get depressed, it's then easier for you to go, aha, I'm depressed. I'm going to allow myself to feel this, this, this depression to understand what I'm going through. When you understand depression better, you master depression to the point that when you feel depressed, you can still function. A lot of people who are depressed are functioning because they know they're depressed and they just continue to function. It's called behavior activation. You activate a behavior for you to just do it. It's like wearing Nike. Just do it. I'm depressed. I wake up. I'm depressed. Just do it. Just dress up. Just get to work. Just go. Although you're depressed. That's being mindful. So be more mindful. Just practice mindfulness. I hope that uh, help. So, okay. That seems to be the last question. If he cannot be mindful, how can he overcome negative thoughts? You do not overcome negative thoughts. You study the negative thoughts. You want to overcome it, you must understand it first. And this is by being friendly to those negative thoughts. Watch them. Watch what happens to them. Watch where they come from. Understanding where they come from. When you see that these negative thoughts do come from somewhere, and they tend to come from your upbringing, what you have heard from parents, other adults, teachers, uh, what you have heard from the media, your friends, many of these things actually affect the way you think. Now, in order for you to control them, you must understand them first. Just like people. Before you can control and manage people, you must understand where they're coming from. So same thing with your thoughts. As painful as they may be, I would suggest you fix your focus on them and see what happens to them. And sometimes these thoughts are very tricky. The more you focus on them, the more they run away. Good enough. <laughs> if they run away, you no longer have negative thoughts, then fine. Move on. So either way, it's a win-win. So understand the pain, where it comes from. Just like any other pain. That's what mindfulness is for. If mind and body is interconnected, would it be easier to get a person out of his depression through physical activities? Yes. Maybe easier, maybe not. But we know from research that physical activity, physical fitness are both very, very important buffers against stress and buffers against depression. In fact, many scientific journal articles have shown that physical activity and exercise are the ones that doctors should prescribe first. Exercise regularly, you find that you have less stress. And if you do get stress, you manage it better. So get fit, get healthy. If you are afraid of exercise, never mind. Do physical activity. Walk. Okay? Do squats. When you mop the floor, mop with gusto. Put some strength into it. You sweep, sweep with gusto, but make sure you don't sweep dust up to people's faces. All right? Sometimes that happens when you do it with gusto. Um, but yes, hiking, walking, you know, in MCO, what do I do? I do floor workouts. I do as many push-ups as I can. Now I do push-up, no problem already. Um, at least 100 a day, no problem. I, I feel like I can go more and more. Um, but that takes practice. Eventually, you just get fit that way. Um, do whatever you can. Cycle. My grandmother-in-law has got this pedal. She cycles every day um, while seemingly meditating. Like for one whole hour, she just does that. I don't think anyone can do that very well. So it's like, wow, I'm inspired. So I got that pedal from my parents as well. Um, she used to walk on a walker, but after cycling for a lot, she doesn't need tongkat anymore or walker. She can walk very, very strongly. She's, what, 86. So yes, um, you know, even at that age, you can get rehabilitated. So yes, please do, um, you know, get physically fit. Walk. Be kind to yourself also, yeah? Don't start going to the gym and carrying heavy weights. You injure yourself. Don't do that. Yeah, don't, don't, don't be a hero. But whatever it is, get moving. 
you know, do yoga, simple yoga. You can't do the split, please don't. You might, again, injure yourself. But yes, I find yoga very helpful because you are forced to be mindful. If you're not, you fall. <laughs> Same thing with Tai Chi. You need to be very mindful. But go easy on yourself. All these kind of uh, activities, just move, keep on moving. You got to move it, move it. So good. Thank you for, for um, you know, commenting there. I, I left it out. So well done. Thank you. All right. Anything else? I think that's about all the questions. Eh? Thank you right. Robin, for the wonderful sharing and the, <clears throat> the very skillful handling of the questions. You're welcome. I think all of us benefited very greatly from this talk. If you share your slides with us, I'll put it in the YouTube link. Okay, sure. Plus, so, uh, this is recorded, right? Yep. You can turn this into YouTube as well. Yeah, I'll download it to you, upload it to YouTube, and then I'll put your, a link to your slides. All right, okay, sure. Uh, I'll have both, uh, this video and, and the slides. Yep. Okay, great. So, uh, to end of this session, we like to do a short sharing of merits.